Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's event, North Korea Strategic Weapons on Inform Conversation. I'm Mian Oh, Director and Senior Fellow of the Asia Security Initiative, housed within the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security here at the Atlantic Council. I'm delighted to host today's session. With just a month until the U.S. presidential election, it seems much of the discussion in Washington these days is focused on domestic political development. As the world watches the American election unfold in coming days, however, it is important to recognize that there are potentially major strategic developments occurring overseas that may raise key questions for the United States, it, its allies and partners in the Indo-Pacific in an era of great power competition. When it comes to DPRK, we're just eight days away from a major anniversary, the 75th Party Foundation Day. And to borrow a term from American politics, we may be in for our own October surprise from Kim Jong-un. We hear that a new North Korean strategic weapon may be on the horizon and a major announcement in coming days could have major implications for the, for the US Rock Alliance and its joint effort to secure a denuclearized de and peaceful Korean Peninsula. As the Asia Security Initiative continues to work on U.S. alliance and its key role in the Indo-Pacific, we are very fortunate today to be joined by two distinguished speakers with deep expertise on the Korean Peninsula who will explore key questions about North Korea's strategic weapon in a dynamic one-on-one -on -one conversation. General Vincent Brooks and Marcus Garlovskas. We have the distinct honor of being joined by General Vincent Brooks whose incredible career of service and leadership truly cannot be captured in a simple introduction. General Brooks retired in January 2019 as the four-star general commanding UN Command, Combined Forces Command, and U.S. Forces Korea. In retirement, General Brooks continues to be engaged in thought leadership and strategic thinking at the highest level, including the president and chairman, um, of the Korea Defense Veterans Association as a senior fellow in the Harvard Kennedy School of Welfare Center, as a distinguished fellow at, a at the University of Texas, in addition to much more. Next, I'm very proud to announce Marcus is the Asia Security Initiative's newest senior fellow. He was most recently the U.S. National Intelligence Officer for DPRK from July 2014 to June 2020 and comes to ASI the Atlantic Council with the deep expertise and experience he developed while providing direct analytic support to top level policy deliberations, including the presidential transition, as well as the Singapore and Hanoi summits with North Korea. In addition to his time as NIO, Marcus also served for nearly 12 years overseas at the headquarters of the UN Command, Combined Forces Command and US Forces Korea in Seoul. It is truly rare to have two former top leaders to deeply involved in the U.S. Rock Alliance and the Korean Peninsula. So I'm eager to get the conversation started. As a reminder, today's session is on the record and open to the public. Please feel free to submit your question via Zoom, Twitter, or Facebook. Before I turn to Marcus, I'd like to quickly mention that Barry Pavel, Senior Vice President of the Atlantic Council and Director of the Scopro Center, will offer closing remarks after Marcus and General Brooks' fireside chat. Marcus, now the floor is yours. Ian, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. So uh, General, people often ask me, um, what's your ideal job? Um, and I tell them uh, actually somewhat uh, truthfully, but also a bit tongue in cheek, that retired force general sounds like the ideal job to me. It sounds like you're, you're keeping very busy. Um, so uh, I, I also wanted to mention, uh, I, I was very impressed to, to find that you're also a member, and not surprised, by the way, to find that you're a member of the Council on Foreign Relations um, and that you're a principal at, at West Exec. So you certainly are, are a thought leader across a, a whole range of, uh, of issues and categories uh, now that you've uh, you left the, the, uh, the uniform service. Uh, so today, I would like to start off our conversation, sir, if it makes sense to you, with a bit of an intel update. That's a traditional way to start a policy conversation or a, a military briefing. Um, and of course, it'll be unclassified. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll bring up some points to help give our audience up to speed some issues I know that, that you live through. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll turn it over to uh, some comments from you, and then we can uh, talk through some questions of interest 
um, to the alliance and how we deal with the challenges uh, faced by North Korea. That makes sense to you, General? Perfect, Marcus. Thanks a lot. I, I really, really appreciate you taking the, the time for this uh, session, sir. So to, uh, to lead into and recap the situation that we're facing right now, 2016 and 2017 saw an unprecedented level of North Korean strategic weapons testing. Three nuclear tests, dozens of ballistic missiles, uh, including three ICBMs. These demonstrated clear and rapid progress in advancing the credibility and the capability of North Korea's strategic weapons, uh, as were laid out in annual unclassified uh, intelligence community reports. And of course, sir, uh, you lived through uh, most of this period, as you well know, coming into uh, command in, uh, in 2016. Um, but then we saw Kim pause his testing to pivot to diplomacy. And in 2018, we had the Olympics, uh, the Singapore summit. And by the time your change of command in November, the mood was very different. They hadn't fired a ballistic missile in almost a year, and the planning for an additional summit was underway. But ultimately, we saw a slow pivot back to confrontation begin when it became clear there was not complete agreement on a way ahead after Singapore. And of course, this accelerated when Kim was not able to get the deal he wanted out of the Hanoi summit in February 2019. So by April, Kim had publicly set a year-end deadline for a change in the US position. And then just a few weeks after that, weapons testing resumed with short range launches, no, no nuclear ICBM tests. As the end of year deadline approached, North Korea announced static uh, missile engine testing in December and speculation swirled around the cryptic comment from a North Korean official about a Christmas gift. But ultimately there were no new launches uh, when this deadline expired. But at the start of this new year, Kim sent very strong signals that he would be emphasizing development, testing, production and deployment of strategic weapons. This included public statements and, of course, personnel choices. And you may have seen the uh, the article I wrote about uh, Ri Pyeongchul and his rapid rise in the North Korean system um, to to key positions of, of leadership. Ri Pyeongchul, of course, was the uh, the gentleman that Kim Jong Un was seen hugging after successful missile tests. So very uh, associated with the uh, the strategic weapons testing in that heightened period in 2016 and 2017. So so these signals come at the start of the new year, and then the Soleimani strike occurs. Soon after, COVID hits the region, and in the end, North Korea goes into lockdown. Despite the uh, continuing COVID emergency, though, North Korea did uh, later re resume short-range launches by the spring. And the rhetoric on strategic weapons, though, uh, escalated uh, with high-level meetings, including the elevation of the aforementioned Ri Pyeongchul to become the vice chair of the uh, Central Military Commission, a position, by the way, sir, I want to point out that actually was held by Kim Jong-un. Uh, himself back in 2010. So I'm not saying Ri is going to be Kim's successor, but that shows how important of a position uh, that he's in. I think it's very meaningful that he's elevated someone so associated with the strategic weapons program to this key position. Uh, and then, of course, he was again elevated to be a member uh, of the presidium of the Korean Workers' Party, where he's one, literally one of the top five people at the table with Kim for these high-level meetings, frequently seen uh, literally at his right hand. Um, so meanwhile, during this uh, period, uh, Kim Jong-un's mentor, Kim Yong-chol, reappears along with uh, his sister, Kim Yo-jong. He, he uh, puts forward very aggressive rhetoric against South Korea, uh, but Kim Yo-jong pivots away from that by the summer. Uh, and Kim Yo-jong, of course, Kim's sister, was providing very personalized public messaging, uh, including an unusual statement about watching uh, the U.S. Fourth of July celebrations uh, and pointing out that uh, she believed that North Korea would really not benefit uh, from from any uh, any summit in the near term or uh, from provoking um, the United States prior to the election. So sending a signal basically that, that things were on hold. Very unusual to have this come as a personal view uh, of, from a uh, from a North Korean official uh, rather than as a uh, as a statement coming from the regime. But we see that COVID's effects are still lingering, and Kim, of course, has had to deal with three ty typhoons recently. Um, yet he remains defiant. Uh, and we saw his representative uh, just at the UN General Assembly emphasizing North Korea's sacrifices, its success in combating COVID, and then reemphasizing that their strong deterrence is the key to peace on the Korean Peninsula. So that leads up to this moment now, with North Korea having clearly doubled down on its strategic weapons as the basis for natural, national survival, despite all these challenges and set, setbacks that they've faced uh, in, in recent months. Uh, so with the 75th anniversary of the Korean Workers' Party coming on 10 October, as Mion mentioned, there's lots of speculation about a potential October surprise. And a lot of speculation will be sort of a red October surprise, 
uh, referring to the potential for a ballistic missile submarine being the big, big surprise. Honestly, though, I'm skeptical about this possibility and its importance. Now, CSIS has been tracking uh, SLBM activity. There's no doubt uh, that that program continues, uh, the submarine launch ballistic missiles. But I'm frankly more concerned about what mobile launchers and missiles will be displayed in the streets of Pyongyang in that parade that we would expect to see. The 75th anniversary is a big deal in North Korea, and so we would expect a very significant display. 38 North and North Korea News, among others, have been publishing the NK, the, uh, NK News run by NK Risk Group, not North Korean media, uh, have been publishing some interesting analysis of infrastructure improvements uh, that indicate larger and more land-based missiles are going to be displayed in Pyongyang on the anniversary. Uh, and I'll tell you, I'm most concerned about something that may be capable of delivering multiple warheads, multiple reentry vehicles, much more so than I'm concerned about the potential for a solid fuel ICBM, or like I said, more than I'm concerned about the potential for a SLBM activity. Now further, after the parade, after we see what happens in, in early October, after we see what, what happens through the US election, absent some change from the external environment, I expect additional strategic weapons testing for North Korea is just a matter of time. North Korean state media has already noted that Kim no longer feels bound by pledges not to test ICBMs or nuclear weapons. Uh, the state media has repeatedly emphasized strengthening strategic weapons capability with statements from Kim and other senior leaders. And then of course, Kim's elevation, as I mentioned, of Ri Pyeongchol through a series of promotions tells you he's getting a key individual in place who's well positioned to move forward on the strategic weapons program as a priority, uh, someone who's overseen uh, a great many North Korean missile tests. So based on his sister's comments, though, I want to reemphasize, he's probably just going to wait until after the election, until he sees the results before he makes a decision on, on weapons testing. That's certainly the signal that, that uh, I think uh, his, his sister was trying to send to us. But the signal is also clear, I think, that more testing is coming unless there is something else that changed the calculus uh, in Pyongyang. So uh, not, a, not a good news story, sir, I know. But uh, I, I think, uh, as always, we've got to we've got to tell it like it is. So, uh, sir, any any thoughts on what I just laid down? Well, Marcus, uh, first, you're a true pro at doing what you just did. So everyone that just witnessed that just saw how it's done, uh, even in the Oval. So uh, thanks for your service, as you most recently retired. And uh, don't worry about being a retired four-star general. You're doing just fine as it is. Uh, you know, I, I, several thoughts come to mind right away. I think that the first thing is, it, I, I used to use the expression and an adaptation of the expression of the land of the morning calm. I used to refer to Korea as the land of the morning surprise. There's always something different coming, and often it is not what we expect. So even as we think about uh, trying to evaluate why there haven't been any tests recently or why the rhetoric and commentary went the way it did or why Kim Jong-un was not visible for a period of time, what might come in October, what might come in December, all these things. It's always important in my mind to be very, very open about possible outcomes and possible alternatives. Uh, in, in other words, to not get locked in on any potential outcome, but rather to be looking for things that indicate likelihood of outcomes. And then once those outcomes occur, you have to think differently about what does it mean? Okay, so if you see a very significant demonstration on the 10th of October at the 75th anniversary parade, and it's very clear they're preparing for a big one, uh, weapon systems being present are part of the normal pageantry. Is it a threat, though? See, so the, the meaning becomes very important as we look at these things. Are they showing something new? Now, this is, this is another area where you're absolutely a pro you would be looking for every nuance. What is different from the last time? What is different from the 60th anniversary? What weapon systems are new? What things look like they have been adapted and maybe have uh, some advanced technology applied to them? As you talked about multiple reentry vehicles or even maneuvering reentry vehicles, these sorts of things would be indications of continued advancement. What it means thereafter, though, is still very important. So I think we, we, as we're looking at where is North Korea going and where is the situation going, got to keep our eyes open and keep our minds open as well. It could be very much like the change in direction that happened on the 29th of November, 2017. And often these changes can become so abrupt or so even unexpected 
that we might miss it for a little while. I know that the discussions back in November of uh, 17, after that third ICBM launch, as you referred to, uh, in some ways looked like testing was not yet complete because reentry had not been fully evaluated. Uh, the ability to withstand the forces of reentry uh, on the nose cones, the ability to actually miniaturize a nuclear warhead into that nose cone, all those things have not yet been proven that North Korea has the ability. And yet North Korea shifted and went to a new direction. And it was into the, the direction of diplomacy and symmetry, as you've already, already highlighted. So the, the point here is that things can change very quickly in North Korea. Let's rewind the tape to June and see the detonation of the Kaesong liaison office. Things can change very, very quickly in Korea at the hands of North Korea. Keep your eyes open. So let's talk some more. Sir, great comments. And I'd just like to build on that in one way. And that is, uh, I, I think uh, some of the best intelligence estimates turn out to be wrong because they lead to action that actually changes the calculus of the adversary or the, or the negotiating partner. So, so to build on what you just said, I, I think what we saw in, in early uh, 2018 uh, actually would not have played out the way that it did if it hadn't been for a change on our side. The willingness uh, of, of the U.S. Uh, president to engage directly with the North Korean leader, of course, made that uh, di diplomacy uh, extend out into a period of uh, halt to uh, North Korean weapons testing. Uh, I'm skeptical that the North Koreans would have uh, remained in a, uh, in a delay mode or a halt mode in their, in their testing program um, had uh, there not been, uh, for example, the, the, the Singapore summit. Um, so there, there's always, a, a re, as you would call it uh, in, the, in the military environment, uh, the, the red-blue interaction is really key to looking at the, the future. And I think your, your point about remaining agile and looking at the possibilities is key. I, I want to emphasize, I really hope we don't see uh, North Korean weapons testing after the election. I don't think it's, uh, it's immutable that it will happen, but I think we need to be looking at how to uh, forestall it, how to prevent it, or, or how to respond to it, um, as much as we are uh, looking at whether or not it will occur. Because I think uh, we like to say, uh, as, as I think you did many times, the enemy has a vote. Well, in this case, looking at it from the North Korean shoes, I think the U.S., uh, potentially has a vote in the uh, in the next step of uh, how things will unfold. Is that is that fair, General? In in some ways, we do have a vote clearly. So I, I would add that uh, the fall of 2017 sent a considerable set of signals to North Korea that hey, maybe this is is more serious than I think it is. This is different in this episode than all the previous episodes. The U.S. is doing things that we haven't seen before, and now we don't have predictability or expectation about what the actions of the United States and the alliance might be. And so some of the signals that were added in that period of time were how we use some of our military instruments to try to create enough pressure that Kim Jong-un would change his calculation. So this was many months before we got to the Singapore summit. And that's part of the dynamic as well that created a pressure change and then a decision change by, by Kim Jong-un. So this, there, there are things that we can do in casting our vote with regard to decisions that we want Kim Jong-un to make in the North. We don't have full control over it, and there are limits on our effectiveness. We have to be absolutely clear and certain about that. And candidly, we can't always tell if we're having an effect. But it's these, these cumulative actions, especially if it's coupled with these actions, coupled with clear communication, uh, ideally direct communication, then then movement can happen. But right now, I think we're at, at an impasse. I, I do believe that North Korea controls the pace of engagement. Uh, that has been the case for a long time. But certainly, uh, back to the point of the Kaesong liaison office, North Korea blew that up because they're not ready to talk. And after they saw the, uh, the significant landslide victory in President Moon Jae-in's party, and the seating of the National Assembly on the 1st of, uh, of June, suddenly it's, they, they probably expected an onslaught of engagement with North Korea because that would advance President Moon's desired outcomes. And now he had an a, a even stronger base from which to do that. Uh, they weren't ready for that. All the other things that had happened in the months leading up to it, continued effect of sanctions, 
the COVID introduction and they're clamping down to make sure they didn't have any more than was already there. I suspect there's far more than we think there is and way more than they've ever reported. But to make sure that that doesn't become a, a, an effect that truly cripples their institutions. They're bad enough already. Uh, their medical institutions as an example of those institutions that are fully decrepit. So they couldn't handle that. And then the typhoons and the flooding that came on top of that, they had their hands full. Now, at the same time, we can see the clock continues to run. So every day that there's no engagement is another day under sanctions. And that is a two-edged sword. Sometimes the sanctions begin to get weak with every day that passes. In other cases, the sanctions not yet weakened continue to have effect with every day that passes. And so we'll see what, uh, how long North Korea can hold out to wait for a change of the wind. They're clearly waiting for South Korea. I suspect they're gonna wait until 2021 because they have greater leverage with South Korea in the final year of President Moon's administration. Then they'll be ready to talk because they'll think they have greater leverage. With the US though, they wanna see the outcomes of the election as just as you've mentioned, because that will determine which way the wind is going to blow. Uh, they may be making some assumptions that if, if President Trump is reelected, that things will go on the same course they are now. Bad assumption. It doesn't have to go in the same direction that it's going right now. Uh, there are plenty of options that would be available to an incumbent president. An incoming president, if President Biden is elected, there may be an assumption that's going to, it's going to be a resumption of conditions as they were in January 2016 when the Obama administration left office. Not necessarily. So Kim Jong-un is going to have to find something uh, upon which to make his evaluations. And there's not much campaign rhetoric that they can hang on to as they were uh, back in 2015. They were beginning to adjust their sights already in 2015. So we'll see. Uh, that means that we have to wait even longer and North Korea will have to wait even longer to figure out which direction they want to go. A long response there, but that's this, uh, uh, a flow of consciousness there on, on what you just laid out. Wow, spectacular comments. There's so much there I'd like to follow up on, but uh, w one thing in particular strikes me just to, to, uh, as a brief thought. Uh, I think there's another really important variable in why Kim was reluctant um, to uh, to engage with South Korea and why you saw the additional pressure and the uh, the destruction of the Kaesong uh, liaison office and the unleashing of Kim Young Chol and, and Kim Yo Jung to make these uh, these really aggressive comments towards South Korea. I think um, there was frustration on Kim's part um, with the fact that the Moon administration was not so willing to part ways with the United States. Uh, the level of solidarity um, was dissatisfying to Kim, and and uh, I think he really wanted to try and peel South Korea away from the United States. Uh, in uh, it re really, that's been part of North Korea's strategy for a long time. But I think it was the the the, the disappointment by the level and the level of continued uh, solidarity between uh, Seoul and Washington. I mean, we focus a lot, I think, on on friction and on the challenges uh, and getting the the allies uh, to fully synchronize their efforts. But I think from Kim's perspective, um, one of the reasons he didn't want to engage is because he didn't see that he could really pull uh, President Moon away from. Uh, supporting the U.S. and, and uh, partnering with the U.S. on so many North Korea issues. Is, is that a fair point, General? Oh, it, it absolutely is. I happen to believe that the strength of the alliance is one of the, the best sources of leverage uh, that, are, uh, that would be available to the two countries as they try to engage North Korea. The greater the solidarity, the greater the influence and the effect on North Korea. And it, solidarity doesn't have to mean truly being in lockstep. That, that term comes up in government quite frequently and indeed provides some degree of friction inside of the alliance because there are two cultural approaches that are engaged here, two national approaches, two national sets of prerogatives, and all these things can create tension inside of an alliance. But the alliance has shown that it is durable uh, even under such tensions as the ones I just described. It has endured through now decades of provocations and dangers from North Korea and still uh, continues to endure at the present time. But to be sure, there are two different approaches. And North Korea would like to try to separate the United States and South Korea on two key points. So the approach to peace on the peninsula is what North Korea would like to have a bilateral north-south relationship to address. 
They don't want the United States involved in that. The approach to denuclearization, which North Korea has said they're going to do, although their progress has been slow or maybe even there has been no progress at all. That could be argued too, that things have gone in the wrong direction uh, other than testing. But they would like to see the denuclearization issue to be between the United States and North Korea bilaterally. So when the US and South Korea cooperate on these, you have what could be described as two different arms moving toward North Korea. And I think that's more than North Korea can handle. And as a result, they'll try to sequence and meter the flow between the two. To me, there's considerable advantage in the alliance operating in tandem with one another, not in lockstep. Lockstep infers that one of us is calling the cadence. One of us is beating the drum and the other is to march according to it. And given the cultural differences, that is not an effective approach. Uh, in, indeed, I, I call it the cultural conundrum, and I'll give you one quick example of it. It's the approach to getting to the end state of a final, fully verified, denuclearized uh, North Korea. The Western way of looking at this is, a, you need to show me action, and then I'll engage in a degree of trust because I know you're doing what you said you're going to do, and then we can have a new relationship. So this sequencing of action, trust, and relationship from a Western perspective tends to go in the direction I just described. We're looking for lists. We're looking for things that to indicate that they're indeed moving. Nothing wrong with that, but that may run afoul of a, an Eastern approach, which we hear from South Korea, and, and I, th I think it reflected from North Korea as well. And it's actually, I've told you what I'm going to do. Let's have a new relationship first, and then I can trust you more than I do now. And I will continue to move to the action that I already said I was going to engage in. In other words, it is diametrically opposite. So that first diametric impact, that cultural conundrum manifests itself first inside of the alliance. And then it manifests secondarily in the approach to North Korea. This is something to think about. Yeah, very, very helpful perspective, General, from from someone who's been right in the middle of uh, managing the, the alliance on this issue through some uh, very difficult times. So uh, I've got a couple more things that I, I would like to raise, but I know we've got an audience eager to ask questions, and we see some of them already coming in. So I encourage everyone, please use the uh, the the Zoom the Zoom chat function um, to uh, to bring up those uh, those questions, and uh, and James is going to help me manage that. Um, and then, uh, and then we'll, we'll we'll get to that shortly. But general, I would really like to go back um, to 2017. Um, you mentioned that earlier in in your comments, uh, and certainly um, I felt reading the, uh, the some of the commentary after the Woodward book uh, that uh, there there was some uh, I think some some exaggeration and certainly some some implied criticism. Uh, of the uh, the actions that that we took uh, in in 2017 in response to the testing, I, I think that that it was in some ways being portrayed as sort of reckless brink, brinksmanship. But what you described was a very uh, I think measured uh, and logical approach to uh, trying to signal North Korea um, to to to, uh, to take a different path. Um, so. Do you think we were we were getting close to war at all in 2017, as some have portrayed, or is it more that we would have been on a path to war if things had continued and Kim had escalated without uh, without pause? Well, I can say that uh, neither side, that would be the alliance and North Korea, nor the neighbors, Russia, Japan, and China, none of the above wanted to see a condition of war. And each country was explicit about that. And certainly on a much more global scale, countries did not want to see war erupt again on the Korean Peninsula. At the same time, it was very clear that North Korea was not slowing down in their testing and their pursuit of weapons that would fundamentally alter the nature of the threat posed by North Korea. And we can rewind the tape a, a decade or so and find that that was principally a threat to those on the Korean Peninsula, U.S. forces, South Koreans, expatriates of other countries. The threat was there on the peninsula because North Korea couldn't really reach beyond the peninsula with their effects. And then with the introduction of, of uh, intermediate range ballistic missiles, 
and some of their additional uh, capabilities, some of the asymmetric capabilities, as we call them, cyber capabilities, uh, the pursuit of intercontinental ballistic missiles, suddenly the reach expanded. And it went at least through all of the Japanese archipelago down to Guam, uh, beyond Okinawa, where we have considerable basing. So the suddenly now other areas are being held at risk. The pursuit of intercontinental ballistic missiles put all of the alliances of the United States into risk, all of them. The European alliances, the uh, South Pacific alliances, uh, the Asian alliances, all are in range of the intercontinental ballistic missile, and so is the U.S. homeland. And so that meant that there was potentially a red line, that a capability was now coming into existence that could create existential threats to each of those countries involved, to all of our alliances and to us personally in the United States. Well, how do you address that pursuit? And clearly, uh, the military instrument was one of the ways to address the pursuit. And I would submit to you that I think that we were trying our very best, at least, uh, to be thoughtful about how we were using the military instrument. And key among those efforts was to signal differently to North Korea. Uh, one of my staff officers uh, who continues to serve as a, as a general officer in the Air Force, uh, I give him credit for saying as we were engaging with a congressional group or, or with someone uh, back in 2016 and uh, early 17, what we have here is a situation like a cat that walks along a street in front of a house that has a dog. And the dog reacts to the cat every time the cat walks by. But the, the cat knows the dog is on a dog run and is just far enough away that the dog chokes himself out but never comes across as far as where the cat is. Well, North Korea is the cat in this case, and the alliance is the dog. We have been very consistent about not striking North Korea. There's been no strike from UN command or from the alliance since 1953. And North Korea has pushed the limits over and over and over again. So our efforts militarily were to show the game has changed. And particularly after the July 2017 ICBM launches, the game was changed. We just had the fifth nuclear test a few months before that, and we're just a few months away from having a sixth nuclear test, which we knew the potential, thanks to you, we knew the potential was there for an, another nuclear test. We've had an, a submarine launch ballistic missile uh, event that happened inside of there that changed the calculus. So we needed to change our calculus also and provide options to both national leaders on the use of the military force that would signal something different that there's a greater danger now. So did we get close to war? Yes, we did. Uh, and the, the greatest danger at that time was not the military preparation. It was the absence of direct dialogue. Because when you're involved in signaling, the potential of a signal being missed or being mistaken, misinterpreted, all these things are the potential impacts of signals. And if you're rely, like, relying on the indirects of the signaling, the danger is very, very great. And we, we had significant danger. I think there was excellent restraint by all parties involved when, it was, when it's all said and done. Thankfully, we didn't go over the brink. Uh, Secretary Mattis was always very clear that our purpose is to make sure Kim Jong-un sees two choices and one of them he would never want to take, and that's following a military course. The alternative is to take a diplomatic course. So it was all about the military creating conditions of traction for diplomacy, and that occurred. Was, was it exclusively due to the military? No, that's doubtful. The military's uh, capabilities are, are limited in creating such outcomes, but they're not without effect. And so it was certainly part of the equation, as well as efforts to open dialogue, back channel communications, efforts happening from other countries who still had diplomatic relationships with, with North Korea. All these things came into being to keep us from going over the brink, and we didn't, thankfully. Thank you very much for those comments, sir. Uh, so, when we saw in the in the uh, in the aftermath uh, of those efforts, uh, I think one of the really significant um, achievements, in a way, of what you just described, was to see a halt uh, in the in the testing uh, for a considerable period of time, and certainly no uh, no launches, no nuclear, no launches of ballistic missiles, no nuclear tests 
um, in in 2018. So, uh, so how how significant do you think um, the, uh, the 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 re restraint in testing has has been for the alliance for the, for U.S. interests? Uh, do, does the testing of uh, ballistic missiles other than ICBMs uh, still uh, pose a, a major concern for you, or, is, or should the focus be on on no testing of uh, ICBMs and, and nuclear weapons, uh, no testing, uh, you know, uh, of certain profiles, say no testing outside of the, the Sea of Japan. What, what's your view on on the level of, uh, of restraint that we need to see uh, from North Korea in order to have those, those conditions to be able to move forward with diplomacy and to be able to maintain a credible uh, deterrent relationship with North Korea? Well, as, as with many things, there are challenges on being able to read exactly what North Korea is trying to say, but I think that the continued missile launches, particularly in the spring of uh, 2019 uh, and into the summer, were as much about saying, hey, we still have capability. Don't count us out. Remember, remember, North Korea was successful in 2016 and especially in 17 on causing North Korea to be the center of attention around the world. Virtually every newspaper in the world had something about North Korea on its, on its front page above the fold. And nearly every day, but there was, there was something about North Korea all the time. North Korea had gotten now to the center of attention of the globe. That has dissipated. There are other things happening in the world, and particularly since the uh, cessation of ICBM launches and nuclear testing by North Korea. Summitry kept the attention for a period of time, but the summitry has now fallen off, and the attention on North Korea has fallen off as well. So I think that the, the launches in 19... We're about sending the message, hey, we're still here. Don't forget about us and uh, don't count us out. We're still very, very dangerous. They also were taking advantage of that window of time to do two things. The first was clearly in the first order, and that was to improve their weapon systems. And they did. And so we saw some short range ballistic missiles and some rocket launchers that uh, they were introduced inside of there that are added now to their arsenal, that added to the danger the military danger that exists in Korea every single day. Uh, but their, their second purpose, perhaps, was to keep tension in the alliance structure. So I'm gonna give them some strategic credit. That, that credit is uh, related to the US being heavily concerned about ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles that can reach the homeland and our allies. But that's not what threatens Japan and South Korea. Intermediate range will threaten Japan. Some medium range can reach parts of Japan and uh, both threaten as well as short range missiles and everything else, all the special operations forces, the artillery uh, systems, everything that North Korea has threatens South, South Korea. So the degrees of threat are like concentric rings and I think North Korea recognized that maybe the U.S. would be less vocal, less active on things that only threatened the peninsula. That creates some tension then in the alliance relationship. South Korean officials might say, hey, wait a minute, are you still with us or not? Remember this, we have a mutual defense treaty. It doesn't matter what it is. You can't just focus on ICBMs because they affect America. This, this created some nationalistic behaviors. Uh, in both governments that put tension on the relationship. So if there's a strategic outcome for North Korea in those events, that would be it, to create more tension in the alliance relationship and yet not cross over a threshold that caused the resumption of the military activities that they saw in 2017. Thank you, General. So we've got a lot of questions coming in from the audience and I, I wanna pair two of them together in a way that addresses uh, another thing I wanted to raise, which is the question of time and and really how uh, the the dynamics of time is on our side, time is on North Korea's side, and how that how that's evolved. Uh, I mean, to to uh, recap my own view, I think there was a, a very clear uh, perspective after the agreed framework was was signed, or as it was uh, I shouldn't say signed, but as it was agreed um, in 1994, as we avoided uh the, the need for uh for military action against north korea to halt its nuclear program from that period 
up until uh, I would say 2016, around the time that you assume command, there was this very strong prevailing sense that time was on our side, um, that North Korea had a lot of obstacles to develop its strategic weapons capabilities, um, that its isolation was telling, that China was uh, was coming around in essence. Um, and, and certainly in 2016, as we saw a lot of failed tests from North Korea, I think there, that perception was even maybe a little bit reinforced early in 2016. But by the certainly by the uh, by the by 2017, when North Korea was doing much more dramatic testing, uh, then then I think people started to question, and, and then that saw uh, the actions that you described to try and change that dynamic. And then we get to 2018, um, the sanctions are are building in their effect, and and there appears to be some diplomatic progress, and the the sense is maybe the dynamic has changed, time is back on our side. But here we are now. And, it, and the, the sanctions enforcement seems to be collapsing. North Korea is intransigent. The, the testing uh, is taking place that we just talked about. North Korea is doubling down on its programs. Uh, and so, so the question then becomes, um, what, what are the dynamics that could get potentially time uh, back on our side? And so there was a question from Ambassador Zumwalt, um, uh, distinguished uh, uh, retired diplomat, on what uh, the impact has been on alliance readiness of the pause and exercises, which of course is part of what uh, we think uh, contributed to the environment um, that we had, or I shouldn't say that he asked that he said pause, I think it's more a scaling back. Um, but I, I think that's been a, f a factor um, and that that has positive effects potentially, but also uh, ha has some uh, some concerns for the alliance. And then we got another question looking at the other side of the coin about the uh, the need for more testing by North Korea. Um, from uh, Marcus Schiller, a distinguished expert on, uh, on, on missile, missile programs and missile uh, research and development, concerned that North Korea may have convinced us that they are better than developing these systems than they actually are, and given they, they've done so little testing relative to some other countries, so, uh, so do they need to do more testing to really, really prove the capability? Uh, and, and so is, is that restraint on testing then really limiting the true value uh, and progress of their program um, because those limited tests have been perhaps more symbolic than they than they demonstrate technical progress. Um, I, we're not going to get into a technical discussion about what, what the, the different uh, tests were and this sort of thing, but that whole concept of does North Korea actually need to do a lot more testing and that's why this, this sort of uh, this pause and this restraint in testing uh, has value from time. So it's sort of this question of restraint uh, in the uh, in, in the alliance military activity versus restraint and testing. What are the trade-offs? How does this affect how, and from your perspective, General, how how time is on on uh, either our side or North Korea's side? Well, I think all, all players try to use time uh, to their advantage, but in, in no case can any player believe that they have full control of time and that all the advantages accrue to them. They don't. So there are time advantages for each, and there are time disadvantages for each. Uh, you, you, you hearkened back to the era of uh, following the agreed framework in 1994. Of course, that fell apart with a cheating on a nuclear test. And suddenly now, trust was broken, and we were back into a Cold War that was about to turn into a hot war again. Having served there in 1996 to 1998, that was the first time I commanded in Korea as a lieutenant colonel in front of an infantry battalion of 880 troops, including 80 South Korean troops that were inside of my unit, uh, just behind the demilitarized zone. And we thought at that point in time that it was a matter of time before we were either going to be in a fight or North Korea would collapse because they were under severe economic privation at that point in time, not because of the sanctions as they are today. The sanctions today are even more effective than they were then, but just right, based on right. the decrepitude of North Korean society under uh, Kim Jong-il, Kim, uh, Kim Jong-un's father, of course, and the second of the three Kim leaders. We thought that they were gonna implode at any point in time or looking for signals that they just wouldn't be able to make it. They had, they had scores of people dying from malnutrition and even the humanitarian efforts that were making it across the border weren't enough to, to stave that off. So who had the advantage of time then? If there was time that was needed to build the agreed framework, but that same time was used to perfect the ability to detonate a nuclear weapon, who had the advantage of time? Did we, did we lose advantage because North Korea used time to create that? Well, the same thing you could fast forward into the present. Uh, is this pause in ICBM testing and demonstration 
a time for further advanced preparation, advanced development, testing being done in a different way other than launches. We don't do all of our testing by launches. It's possible that North Korea is doing testing without launches. So it may well be that time is providing them the opportunity to enhance their weapon systems. Clearly the ones that were demonstrated in 2019, they took advantage of the time. But time also means another day underneath of biting sanctions. And yet those biting sanctions with time that passes, as I said earlier, become more and more difficult to enforce given the degree of international uh, involvement in those, uh, those historic UN Security Council resolutions and the effect that came after them. I, I like to use the example of the uh, Security Council resolution that called for the ejection of foreign workers from UN countries, UN member states around the world. And that by December of 2019, they were required to expel them. And many countries did uh, through 2017 up to the end of 2019. Many had already done that. So North Korea workers were sent home. That's a big deal because that remuneration of monies earned abroad is a big part of North Korea's economy. That's, that cre creates money coming into the coffers because it's sent back to North Korea. But in this case, some countries simply changed the status of the North Koreans who were there. And now they didn't need to eject them. They went from being foreign workers to being students. And that's particularly the case with Russia. So the, the sanctions over time may become weakened, leaving more room for this dynamic to reintroduce itself where there's development, there's obfuscation, there's denial and deception, there's pressure, there are strings in the alliance. All these things continue to move over time. So I'm not gonna give time advantage to anybody. I'm going to say the time is neutral and all sides try to use it. Sometimes they do well with it and more often they lose on it. Now, do they need more time to test? Yeah, I think certainly because certain things were suspended. And at the same time, with every month that passes without a test and with suppositions that North Korea is still doing development, the potential for the threats to the U.S. and its allies remain. So we can't stand down. We have to continue to put resources into improving defensive conditions, whether that's uh, interceptors in the United States or early warning systems or integration of systems that are already deployed so they can defeat a more advanced array of threats. There's still investment that's happening as time goes on. This is how it really works, okay? And you know, for me, as a commander, I, I would be in a different position than you as the national intelligence officer. If there were a missile launch that was on a trajectory for the United States, one of these intercontinental ballistic missiles, instead of one that was gonna be lofted and that would land in the Pacific Ocean, but rather was on a trajectory toward the United States, we would all assess it has the capability to carry the nuclear weapons that we've seen tested, but we wouldn't know. And so you would be given the task of finding out, does it have a nuclear weapon on it or not? I got, I got to know because our response is going to be tied to that. But for me as a military commander, it's going to be, if it's going to arrive over top of the United States, it has to be intercepted no matter what is in it. It could be an empty warhead, right, right. much less a nuclear warhead. And that interception might also be coupled with immediate counterstrike just because of the trajectory of that. And we were certainly postured to strike North Korea in the middle of their missile launches. We were ready to do that had we been told to do that. Thankfully, we didn't have to, but we were ready to do that. And so that capability exists. Time is not always our friend. Time can be very, very challenging to try to work through. Yeah, to, uh, to go back to uh, Ambassador Zumwalt's question yes. and, and try and tie, the, tie this talk together. About that. So, so I have a I have a, a thought on this uh, that I'd like to propose. So one of the things that I'm I've, I've been really focused on is the importance of of really stopping North Korea's testing and not, not just of ICBMs and, and nuclear weapons, but recognizing any ballistic missile launch that violates UN Security Council resolutions is going to be progress for North Korea and and a setback really for for efforts to get 
um, diplomacy on the on the track of really uh, it headed at least headed in the direction uh, a positive direction toward denuclearization, even if it's a, a distant goal. Um, but one of the concerns is what's the price you're paying to get that? And, and so uh, to go to M M Ambassador Zumwalt's thought, I think he's implying here that the that and certainly I have this concern that over time, as you scale back the exercises, there's a cumulative potential effect on the alliance and on readiness that builds over time. Whereas it seems from the North Korean perspective, if they stop uh, testing for a period, they still can build up capability. Um, they can still, as you point out, do forms of testing that don't involve uh, flight tests that we can see. Uh, and then uh, and then in the end, they're more prepared when it does come time for them to you know, break the moratorium or just break out and, and conduct testing. Um, and at the same time, as you pointed out, the sanctions efforts really seem to be atrophying so badly, particularly because uh, of China and where it's been at uh, with enforcement. But then the other you know, factor is COVID has sort of made the whole sanctions question uh, kind of uh, moot in a way, right? So, so that whole variable of, do you, do you think the, the restraint the Alliance has shown uh, in terms of uh, military training um, is having cumulative effect over time? Um, and, and do you think uh, doing that as a part of an effort to, to stop uh, testing or, or to at least get North Korea to, to restrain it, is, is it a, an effective trade-off right now? Are we in the right place? Well, Marcus, I, I think certainly at the early point when the decision was made by President Trump to have us suspend the fall exercise that was uh, just a few months away from the date of the Singapore summit, as I've said before, it was a surprise to us, but it was understandable. If our objective was to create traction for diplomacy, then I, I can certainly see why that would be an option. I think it was a it was a an additive offer to North Korea because that wasn't as critical to North Korea as we understood it. They understand the purpose of, of exercises and they conduct them. They haven't stopped, by the way. Exactly. But it was to, it was really to try to create a, a traction. Okay. Now over time, the traction didn't seem to yield value on that particular suspension. Having said that, as a military commander, I was never told to make my force unready. I was simply told not to do that exercise. And so we found other creative ways to keep sharpening our edge, okay? Sharpening the edge of our sword. Perhaps we were told to put it in the sheath when it came to that exercise, but that didn't mean it was supposed to get dull and we were not supposed to remember how to use it. And so we did exercise in different ways to try to diminish the amount of degradation. There is some, I mean, there's no doubt. The best training for war is war, okay? So anything short of that might not give you the full set of, of experiences and stimuli that you would have if you were in war, because you get really good in war if you happen to live. But so it's logical that anything shorter than that, anything that you take out of a scenario, any uh, reduction of iterations would create some, uh, some degradation. Okay, so I, I acknowledge that, but that's a trade-off. How much risk emerged from the degree of degradation that happened in the Alliance force? I don't think it was very significant, honestly. I think we still had a highly professional force that had considerable military advantages. We didn't have the advantage in numbers, but we had absolute advantage in skill and capability with that Alliance. Uh, 680,000 troops on a day-to-day -day basis and over a million and a half to two million in time of war if they were mobilized in the Iraq US Alliance. So we were not without capability and we could take some risk to gr create greater traction for diplomacy. What is the cumulative effect of that over time? It, it's been slowed. You know, my, my successor, uh, General Bob Abrams is a creative trainer and my counterparts then in Korea and his counterparts in Korea now in the Rock Joint Chiefs of Staff and in the Ministry of Defense are creative warriors. They're gonna find ways to stay ready. I happen to believe that we're past the utility of involving exercises in the diplomatic dialogue at all. It is no longer relevant to the dialogue and shouldn't be brought up anymore. That's my opinion. It's, it's, it's not of value. Other things are more valuable. Let me come to your point about sanctions becoming uh, somewhat weakened over time, particularly with China. Uh, that's true in in some respects, and indeed COVID did have some effects on limiting what comes into North Korea, almost a self-imposed sanction by North Korea, but there's still illicit 
transfers of oil and coal that are happening, things that are important to North Korea's economy. There's still remuneration that's happening. Uh, some of the embassy presences of North Korea abroad have resumed their secondary work, maybe it's their primary work, of generating funds through activities in those countries to send back to uh, North Korea. That would mean their secondary purpose is diplomacy. And so there are things that are happening abroad still that show that there is there is some leakage. But this is leakage uh, that is coming through a system that is perhaps the tightest we've seen in recent history. Is that okay for North Korea? Can they handle that? How much longer? So this point of trying to force them to stop development, to me, uh, requires us to really concentrate more on the indirect methods of forcing, like sanctions, like pressure, like diplomacy, like moving toward uh, alternative outcomes, than the first order, which is physically preventing them from being able to advance their weapon systems. That, the, the impact of doing that means going to war. And so going to war to stop it will mean all of the limitations that come with war. You don't know what the outcome of war is going to be once you embark upon it. And you might not even get to the objectives that you want. You're going to end up somewhere else, for sure. All wars end up in a different place than they were intended and where they started. So the indirect approach to stopping North Korea's development is where our energy really needs to be concentrated. And it will generally be more effective because it leads to North Korea deciding not to continue to advance. And that's where the change is going to come from. Sir, that very, very helpful and candid uh, analysis. Uh, th thank you so much for, for going into that depth. Uh, I think uh, overall, one of the characterizations I can take away from our conversation is that you're you're still optimistic about the prospects for denuclearization, and I'm sort of as the uh, intelligence officer <laughs> delivering the the bad news, uh, uh, a, a bit more pessimistic about what what can be achieved at least for the, for the near term. Not saying we couldn't get to denuclearization someday, but in the near term, I'm more I'm more thinking that this is a problem that realistically we can only manage and and not really uh, not really solve. Um, and, uh, I, I, but, uh, but to be fair, I think you and I are still fairly close on a, on a wide range of issues. So, uh, thanks to the audience for the questions in general. Thank you very much for, for your time. Uh, you we're much. at the point now where I, I should turn this over to, uh, Barry Pavel, um, the, the senior vice president, a senior vice president of the Atlantic council and the director of the Scowcroft center for strategy and security of which I'm a very proud part. Um, and so with that, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Barry. Thanks very much, Marcus, and thank you, General Brooks. I, I learned a, a ton in this really cogent, <laughs> short uh, discussion, and, and I'm craving more. These these clearly are uh, times of dramatic change in North Korea and the broader global security landscape. We heard a lot about North Korea's evolution, including in its strategic weapons programs, uh, and there's other sort of really structural challenges I see for the Republic of Korea and the United States. Those also include a growing global competition with China, uh, which has its own continuing evolution and growth in uh, various capabilities. And we're also amidst a pandemic that continues to uh, uh, um, cause major security challenges for, for both countries and the world. So it strikes me that the future trajectory of this trio of challenges is uncertain, but they're clearly major security issues for the US ROK alliance. I think the alliance is essential for managing these types of challenges. and. It really does, though, need to further adapt. We heard a little bit about its adaptation uh, in this discussion, but it needs to further adapt to address uh, these broader challenges as well. How it adapts? Well, that's a topic for a session uh, very soon, later this year, when the Scowcroft Center's Asia Security Initiative releases a major new report on the future of the Alliance. So please stay tuned, stay engaged with us. We welcome your thoughts and participation. And thank you for joining everyone. We will see you again very soon. Many thanks. General Barry, thank you.